Thank you, Chris. And uh, turn with me, uh, all of you 815ers and fellow morning allergy sufferers, uh, you know who you are. Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, if you have uh, a ribbon, you know, one of these things, uh, or a piece of paper, put, a, put the ribbon or the piece of paper in 1 Corinthians 6. We'll be there later this morning, uh, but it might help me and, and perhaps you uh, if you make some kind of uh, attempt to have 1 Corinthians 6 ready uh, when, when the time comes. But my, my topic and title, uh, which has been allotted to me, uh, is how then shall we live in this world? How then shall we live in this world? And uh, my text is Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2, and let's pray together. Father, as we turn now to the Scriptures, all Scripture is given by the outbreathing of God and is profitable for doctrine and instruction and correction in the way of righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. No Scripture is of private interpretation, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest and all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual or reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How then shall we live in this world? In this world, in this world of sin and rebellion, this world on which the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. I appeal to you, therefore. Now, the question, of course, and you've heard it many times, the question that you have to ask when you see the word therefore is, what is the word therefore? Therefore. Why is it there? And Paul is drawing now a conclusion. It's not the first time that Paul has addressed in the course of his epistle to the Romans what amounts to an imperative, the doing section. He has actually addressed it on a couple of occasions before. He has told us in the fifth chapter of Romans, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So, Paul has made a very specific application, a moral application, an imperative as to the use of our bodies as instruments of righteousness. And then in the middle of the eighth 
chapter. He has given that imperative, if ye by the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. We are to be engaged in putting sin to death, remaining sin, remaining corruption. But now as he turns to chapter 12, there is going to be an extended uh, section covering several chapters in which Paul is going to answer the question, how then shall we live in this world? And he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. And again, Paul is returning to the grammar of the gospel, making sure that we understand that these imperatives, these, these verbs of command, these doing verbs, these verbs that bring a sense of ought and obligation now upon the Christian, these are responses to the mercies of God that we have already experienced. Obligation follows grace. Paul isn't reverting to a kind of performance mentality that by doing we earn our way into the kingdom of God, but as those who have experienced the mercies of God, who have been brought out of darkness and into light, who have been justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, by the grace of God alone, there is a therefore. Now, in doing that, of course, Paul is all too conscious that in verbs of obligation, there is, of course, a looking at ourselves. And looking at ourselves can bring all kinds of pastoral difficulties. And so, I am reminded this morning, even as we begin to unfold this passage of the words of Robert Murray McShane, that for every look at yourself, take a hundred looks at Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful piece of pastoral advice. Every now and then we are to examine ourselves, we are to look within, we are to test whether the fruits of the Spirit are being manifested in a, in a way that corroborates the profession of faith that we make. But for every look at yourself, Take a hundred looks at the Lord Jesus. Now, there are four things I want us to see as we look at these familiar uh, verses, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, four things that characterize our response to the grace of God in the gospel. And the first is that ethical consequence, how then shall we live in this world? The first thing I want us to see is that ethical consequence involves sacrifice. That's the first principle that Paul wants us to understand. It involves sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's such a rare word in contemporary Christianity, I think. There's almost something old-fashioned about it, that we're meant to sacrifice for the gospel. We're meant to sacrifice for Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say? If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up a cross and follow me. Now, you understand that a cross is not a piece of jewelry made of platinum or gold or silver that you hang around your neck as a, as, a, as, a, as a piece of jewelry, something beautiful to look at. It's rather odd, isn't it, that we would ever think of doing that. It would be like having, having a syringe or a, a little electric chair or a little platinum version of a gas chamber. Because what is the cross? It is a civil instrument of execution. G. 
Jesus says, no, I'm not telling you to put a piece of jewelry around your neck and uh, make you feel all warm and cozy uh, in the mornings, uh, like some kind of talisman uh, that keeps you safe from the hurts and, and, and dangers and trials and difficulties out there, like a, like a, a, a Christian version of a rabbit's foot. No, this is what Jesus is saying. When you come to me, I want you to come and die. Die to yourself. Die to your ambitions. Die to your dreams. Die to your aspirations. Not, not my will, but yours be done. Thomas Akempis, in his uh, book, uh, The Imitation of Christ, put it this way, very famous statement that he made, if you will bear the cross, it will bear you. If you will bear the cross, it will bear you. Now, you understand here, Paul isn't asking us to make sacrifices. That's not the point. I'm not saying that we shouldn't make sacrifices, but that is not the point here. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to make sacrifices. He wants you to be a sacrifice. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Here, Lord, before the cross of Jesus Christ, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Jesus wants you, not a part of you, but you. So the ethical consequence involves, first of all, sacrifice. Secondly, the ethical consequence that Paul has in mind here involves the entire person to present your bodies the ESV has, to present your bodies, or you could render that to present the whole person as a sacrifice. One of the probably greatest privileges I've ever had in my life was to meet and become a friend uh, to a remarkable woman. Uh, she lived in Belfast and still lives in Belfast in uh, Northern Ireland, and I'm referring to Helen Rosevear. You have to be of a certain generation, I think, to have met and heard Helen uh, Rosevear. She, she is, without any shadow of a doubt, the most remarkable woman uh, I've ever encountered in my life. And for uh, 17 years or so, when I lived and ministered in Belfast. Uh, I had the privilege of seeing her on uh, many, many occasions and ministering to a ministry that she had to young uh, girls, a discipling ministry for young girls, and I would uh, go and speak at those meetings uh, once or twice a year and uh, just got to know her a little. And you know her story, of course, how in the 1950s and then in the 1960s in what was then uh, Congo. Uh, she was uh, captured uh, by terrorists, uh, we would call them today, and uh, she was taken uh, prisoner for uh, many, many months, five, six months or more, uh, and she was, uh, she was repeatedly abused and raped. You have read her story, I am sure, many of you, and uh, the godliness of this, uh, of this uh, woman. And I remember uh, on the one occasion where I heard her uh, relate, and she, she always had a reluctance to relate this story. She, she, wanted, she wanted us to know the story, but she wanted us to know the story as 
she would want us to know the story, uh, because it, the, not for the not for the salacious uh, details of her imprisonment and the abuse that she suffered, but uh, the moment when she describes the first uh, encounter with these men and and the fear that gripped her as to what these men uh, were going to do to her, and uh, and hearing uh, in her mind's eye not a not a f- physical audible voice, but a but a a whispering of God within her mind and in her soul uh, in those moments uh, that uh, Jesus saying to her, I… they're not doing this to you, they're doing it to me. I I want your body. And uh, you can't read those words uh, without being gripped by the totality of her self a resignation to the demands of the gospel in, uh, in ways that go uh, extraordinarily uh, deep. This is, uh, this is Helen uh, Rosevier, and Paul is saying here, uh, present your bodies. Uh, he's not asking here for some kind of mystical heart uh, experience. He's talked about it earlier in the sixth chapter of Romans, about our bodies as instruments. Our bodies can be instruments of righteousness or unrighteousness. And he's saying, I want your bodies as instruments of righteousness. Take my hands. Take my feet. Take my eyes. Take my body, take me in all of its totality. He wants the entire person. He wants all of you. I want everything there is of you. I don't want just little bits of you and little compartments of you that you portion out and you say, well, one for Jesus and one for me and one for Jesus and one for me. No, I want, I want it all. Not just the mind, not just the intellect, but the heart and the affections and the body. Yes, the body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit in all of its totality. We we speak of total depravity. But we also speak in another way, in a sense of, of total sanctification, in a definitive sense, that when we are regenerated and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, we belong now to Jesus Christ, lock, stock, and, and barrel, everything about us. You know, nowhere does Paul, and, and I'm not going there yet, but, but nowhere does Paul make that clearer than in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's talking to the Corinthians, and he's talking about adultery, and he's talking about, about visiting a harlot. Imagine what in the world is going on in the church in Corinth, that sexual abuse in the marriage is taking place in the church in Corinth, and he's saying to the Corinthians, you know, when you visit a harlot, you, you, can't, you can't check out Jesus at the door and pick Him up on the way out. That when you are united to a harlot, you unite the Lord Jesus to a harlot. That's what sin is. That's the ugliness of it. The ethical consequence involves sacrifice, and the ethical consequence involves the entire person. And then thirdly, the ethical consequence is an act of worship. Now, look at the, look at the words, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your Well, I don't know why the ESV uh, renders this spiritual worship. The word is logical. 
I don't actually get how you get from logical to spiritual. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow the translation reasoning here. Some of you have a different uh, translation here. It is a reasonable service or a reasonable act of worship. We still speak about worship as a service. Service begins at 8.30 or 9, so we, we, we interchange the word service and worship. But, but here, Paul is, is, is speaking and using a word. You know, it's the logical thing when you belong to Jesus. When you've experienced the mercies of God, it's the logical thing that you worship Him, that you give yourself to Him as an act of worship. You bow down before Him and you say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. I give myself back to Him. You know, one of those passages in the Old Testament that just completely takes my breath away every time I read it, Hannah, and uh, she's praying, you remember, in the temple, and Eli, who's old and uh, losing his marbles, and uh, just on the point of senility or something of that kind, and uh, his eyesight perhaps is failing, and uh, he sees her lips moving, but she's not saying anything, and he, he accuses her of being drunk, and Elkanah, well, he's gone out and bought a new model because he has another wife who's producing babies every year with irritation. And Hannah wants a child. And uh, those of you here who have the burden and the trial and the cross that uh, God has put into your lives of uh, childlessness and uh, the peculiar and particular pain of that, you enter into Hannah's prayer. You understand her prayer, but, but what does she say? Lord, give me a son, and I'll give him back to you. Takes my breath away. Give me a son, and I'll give him back to you. And uh, that's precisely what she does. And, and it's a little illustration here of uh, what uh, Paul is saying is the consequence of the gospel. It's the consequence of the Reformed faith. It's a consequence of Reformed soteriology. It's a, it's a consequence of the mercies of God that we give ourselves away in worship. It's a logical thing. Stands to reason. If Jesus Christ is God, and He died for me, nothing is too great for me to do for Him. Hudson Taylor, Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Ethical consequence involves worship, the worship of the whole man, the worship of mind and body and soul and affections and, and will and everything that constitutes our renewed humanity in Christ is to be given over now as an act of worship. Yes, worship here in the broadest possible sense in, in, in all of life. Now, I know this verse is used uh, in the worship wars as a verse that covers all of worship, including gathered worship and Sunday worship and, 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 and worship that involves the sacraments and, and so on. And, uh, and this verse is, uh, is a broad and generic uh, verse here. And he's not, he's not talking about the specifics here of uh, particular gathered worship, but he's talking here about all of life the totality of life as an, as an act of worship. And then fourthly, we see here that the ethical consequence involves sacrifice, and the ethical 
consequence involves the entire person, the ethical consequence involves worship, and fourthly, the ethical consequence is countercultural. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world and its worldviews. When I was uh, growing up in the 1960s, uh, let me be clear, I'm a child of the 50s, but I was a teenager in the 60s. And I do vaguely, and I mean vaguely because when my sister was listening to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, I was listening to Beethoven and Brahms. I know, I know, but that was me, and it still is me. But I do vaguely remember the kinks. <laughs> I'm a dedicated follower of fashion. How many of you remember that? Yes, not many, <laughs> which I think is a relief. I'm a dedicated follower of fashion. Yes, we are. Amazing, isn't it, how, how uh, suits now, if you've got turnips on your, on your trousers, you're not a dedicated follower of fashion. <laughs> ties, you know how many of us have bought ties and then, and then after a while, there's no way you can wear that tie, whatever possessed me to buy that tie. And uh, shirts with collars that uh, are at 90 degrees and 45 degrees and 120 degrees, and, and, they're, and, and they're shirts that are almost like aeroplanes that they're about to fly. We are dedicated followers of fashion. And Paul is saying to Christians who love the truth and know the truth, do not be dedicated followers of fashion. Be nonconformists. You know, that's why I love being a Presbyterian. Because another term for a Presbyterian is a nonconformist. I love that term. Uh, you remember J.B. Phillips' wonderful uh, translation or, or, or rendition of this verse, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. And how do you do that? By the renewing of your minds. By the renewing of your minds. One of the ways to ensure that you're not conformed to this world is to read good, solid literature by the renewing of your mind. You know, when I first became a Christian in 1971, somebody put a little booklet into my hands. It was. Uh, it was just a little booklet, and it was called Your Mind Matters. It was by John Stott. I think it was written in 1967. Your mind matters. You know, there are Christians, and they check their minds at the door. They go to worship, and, and they, they have a great time and a great experience, and they're lost in the moment, and their hearts and affections are engaged. like going to a concert, or the opera, or a ball game, and your affections get, get into it, but you've checked your minds at the door, 
Your mind matters. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed in your thinking by renewing your minds. I'm amazed. I, I am constantly amazed how few books educated Christians actually read. Uh, to, to quote something that Dr. Sproul said yesterday, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking now about uh, uh, folks with, uh, who are doctors and lawyers and uh, who have uh, advanced degrees, and uh, to get them to read one Christian book, it's like torture. Listen to Paul. Your mind, your thinking, your worldview needs to be changed, and the way, you, the way that gets changed is, is in the mind. It's by your thinking and reasoning. Now, if you read on in this passage, you'll see that Paul has many things to say about how this renewal takes place, and it takes place in the life and context of the church, and you'll see that in verse 4, he segues, we are one body, we have many members, the members do not all have the same function, and so on, and he segued now from the renewing of our minds and not being conformed to this world by the importance of the local church and our gathering together with the people of God and with in the context of the fellowship of the Lord's people, our minds are renewed so that our bodies can be given over as an act of worship to the Lord. But I want to, um, I want to take a specific example here, and uh, that was the charge that I was given. Uh, not only to address this in a general way, but to address it in a very specific way. How then shall we live in this world? In what way is this world trying to squeeze us into its mold? So turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6 and uh, verses 9 through 11. And uh, forgive me, this is the 8.15 session, and uh, we're going to look at something that is a little distasteful, perhaps for some, but it's part of the Word of God. It's part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it is here for our instruction and admonition and encouragement. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, let me ask a question here. What is Paul talking about? And uh, I want to focus on the words, uh, men who practice homosexuality. And I do that simply as an example. Uh, it is surely a, a current agenda. It is on every news bulletin. It's in every newspaper. Uh, it's everywhere around us. We are, being, we are being squeezed by the world and by the culture in which we live, uh, no matter whether that's the uh, intellectual culture of the university or the highest person in office in this country today or legislators 
or school teachers in public schools or wherever you, you go. We are being squeezed by the entertainment uh, industry again and again to conform to the spirit of this world, to conform to the ethical standards of the world. And Paul is saying in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. So let's look at this as an example. What's Paul talking about here in 1 Corinthians 6? Well, he's talking about lifestyle. Now, I know he's not simply talking about homosexuality. He's talking about a lot of other things, about thievery and greediness and drunkards and revilers and swindlers and so on. So, he's, I'm not saying for one minute that homosexuality is a greater, more, more, more ab abominable sin than any other sin. That's not my point. I'm simply focusing on this one because it is so current. And folk are asking, what are we supposed to think about this? Well, let's look at what Paul says. He's talking here about lifestyle. He's talking here about regular behavior patterns. I don't think he's talking here about occasional lapses followed by repentance and forgiveness, but he's talking here about something that is established, an established pattern in the life of somebody who professes to be a believer. He's talking about what, uh, what is Paul saying about these, uh, about these habits. They are ways of sin that if not repented of and forsaken, will keep people, will prevent people from entering into the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. That a lifestyle, an unrepentant lifestyle, style of homosexuality will, will keep you from the kingdom of God. That's what Paul seems to be saying. Those who claim to be Christ's should avoid the practice of same-sex physical connection, malakoi aute arsenokoitai. The Greek. It's, it's very graphic in Greek. Male bedders would be a literal translation. Unmanly would be a literal translation. He's saying the person who is the female in the role here of same sex. That's, he's that graphic here in the Greek. And what is Paul saying about, about this? He's not saying that those who have engaged in this can never enter the kingdom of God. He says, and such were some of you. This was your lifestyle. But God, in His sovereign mercy and grace, came, and He changed you, and He gave you a spirit of repentance, and He enabled you to turn from that lifestyle and from that practice and to turn and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as He is offered to us in the gospel. Now, let's be absolutely clear what Paul is saying here about this. This is a practice. He's not saying, he's not saying that true, genuine, justified, spirit-indwelt, Christ-united Christians can suffer and, and, and experience same-sex attraction. He's not saying that. And for some, that… that that cross, that, that issue will be with them for the rest of their lives. But what he is saying is, those who make it a practice, a lifestyle, cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is countercultural, isn't it? I mean, the culture around us is saying, well, you know, what is the ethical standard of the culture around us? Uh, so long as no one gets hurt, that's the, that's the principal ethical standard of the world today. So long as, so long as nobody gets hurt, uh, what's the harm in it? 
You know what people do in their own lives is none of our business. Well, it's Jesus' business. It may not be the state's business and in certain instances it may not be the church's business, but it is most certainly Jesus' business. What you do as a professing Christian, you may have these struggles, you may have these issues, and, and there are a multitude of reasons why that is so, and you may have them for the rest of your life. And God is saying to you, if you continue in this practice, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, how does a relativist hermeneutic work here? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's, here's how conformity to the world might, might manifest itself in the life of the church and in the lives of uh, Christians. It might come to a passage like this and say, you know, what I do doesn't bear any relationship to what Paul is talking about here. Whatever Paul is talking about here was something entirely different. This was, this was something, something, something that involved harm of some kind. You can, you can bring into the interpretation here something that suggests that whatever it is Paul is talking about, it's not the loving relationship that you have. You, you can do that. That's a relativist hermeneutic that can be employed. Or you might uh, adopt uh, the hermeneutic, the popular hermeneutic. You know, if you ever you go to a Bible study and somebody says, um, I like to think what Paul is saying, I, I mean, get ready for it. <laughs> because who knows what's going to come out? Because it is a hermeneutic based on personal opinion without any insight whatsoever to the context of what Paul is saying. Right, you might approach a passage like this, and uh, you might approach it with a kind of multi-interpretation hermeneutic that's uh, driven by personal experience. I like to think that, or I feel this is what God is saying here. Who cares what you feel? <laughs> Unless there is an objective standard for ethics. What we have in this country is 250 million standards, all based on personal feeling. Actually, that's precisely where we are. It might suggest something like this, that this kind of focus here on one particular sin, well, it's just so unhelpful. Because we're all sinners, right? Yes, we're all sinners. I deserve God's judgment too. Who are you to judge? Oh, there you go. The most misquoted text from the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not lest ye be judged. So I can make no ethical judgment whatsoever. Somebody comes and steals your wallet. You cannot make a judge, judge not. <laughs> Your spouse has an affair, judge not, lest you be judged. We're all sinners, right? It might come in this way. All this emphasis on sin, it just misses the whole point about grace. You know, what we need is, what we need is grace. What, what we need is just talk about grace. We need to talk about the gospel. We need to talk about grace and sanctification. It'll, it'll, it'll just take place by itself. It'll just happen. So, all you need to do is talk about grace. 
and all these things will just disappear. Well, I have to tell you, for the last 35 years, they have not. I still wake up in the morning grumpy until I've had my cup of coffee. <laughs> Every single day I wrestle against the world and the flesh and the devil, and I have to address myself. There is an ethical imperative that is a consequence to the experience of the mercies of God in the gospel. Now, my dear friends, uh, please don't misunderstand what I'm doing here this morning. Here, here is Reformed conservative Christianity once again having something to say about uh, homosexuality or lesbianism. I do so this morning not because that is the greatest sin in the world, because it isn't, but it is a sin. The practice, the lifestyle is a sin, and no amount of fanciful exegesis and interpretation can get away from what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 6. And bless God that Paul adds, and such were some of you that the church in Corinth was actually filled with sinners who once practiced this lifestyle. But what are they now? They are those who used to be practicers of this lifestyle. That's what they are. How then shall we live in this world, you and I? as Christians, as a nonconformist. Ah, but you're saying, if I become a nonconformist on uh, the practice of homosexuality, as an example, that's going to make me so countercultural. It's going to make me so negative. It's going to make the church look so negative. Well, what's the alternative? You can conform to this world. You can say, but it's none of our business. You can adopt an ethic that says, uh, so long as nobody gets hurt. I mean, if they love one another, what's the problem here? And you can adopt an ethical standard that is wholly contrary to the Word of God, unless the Word of God the infallible, inerrant Word of God is the root and basis and foundation of our ethics. We are lost. We are adrift in a sea of relativism. And Paul is calling upon the church and he's calling upon individual Christians to present their lives and their bodies and the instruments of their bodies as a sacrifice, as an act of worship. as an act of worship. Every time you are tempted to sin, you must ask the question, can I bring Jesus into this? Try it. I guarantee that what you are thinking is, I've left Jesus outside the door. When I close the door and I switch on my laptop, what I do in my own private time has got nothing to do with anyone else, and it has nothing to do with Jesus. I pick Jesus up when I close the lid. And my dear friend, that is as far away from a biblical ethic as you can possibly get. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are in union and communion with Christ. The body is Christ's body. And that's Paul's ethic here in 1 Corinthians 6 in a very specific setting. Be not conformed to this world. Let's be a people, and it'll cost us. Oh, for sure it'll cost us. It may cost us dearly. Sometimes I think we are returning to those days in which the apostles themselves lived 
And they didn't live in those persecuting days with gloom and doom. They lived with optimism for the gospel. What is it that can transform this culture of ours? What is it that can change the oppressive meta-narrative that surrounds us? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Father, we thank You. Thank You for the Scriptures. Thank You for these passages in the New Testament that speak to issues that concern some of us here this morning. For we know this in our own lives, perhaps. We know its allurement. We know the temptation. We know the desire. And we want with all of our hearts for those desires to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Grant us the grace of mortification. Grant us grace to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my eyes and take my hands and take my feet, and take my sexuality, and take everything there is of me, every single thing there is of me, and make it yours, holy and absolutely and without reserve. And grant us the fullness and strength of the Holy Spirit every day to run in the opposite direction to the standards of this world that we might be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we might know what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of Yours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.